walleye this time of year is typically when we start seeing them switch over to shad for the most part. Okay. Like obviously, early in the year, we were seeing all those mayfly carcasses and stuff like that. Sure. But usually, mid-September, October, that's when they're just gorging themselves on the shad. Okay. Same with the smallmouth. They'll move on to those two just because there's the influx. Let's try to help the guys um, quantify shad then. So what is this, wh where are these shad going to naturally want to be yeah, so for, let's say, the next month? The next month, yeah. So normally they move inshore at night. Okay. So this is the time of year when night bite really starts to get hot. Uh, especially from shore, like when we do our shocking, we'll see guys out fly fishing with stripper baskets and stuff like that over by like Williams Park, and they they catch a lot of fish doing it. Sure, um, there would be no reason why you wouldn't. Exactly, yeah, it's just that inshore migration and everything follows, it, and it, it's great. The common thought was always water temps had to be below 50 before you'd even think about you know, shore casting at night. Yeah. Um, but you just said if the food's there, it's so are the guys eating the food. Exactly. And and now you're talking to these shad when you say push on shore, right? On shore? Yeah, pretty close. Pretty really? close. Yeah. I mean when we do our shocking, we get right up to shore. Like we're in a pontoon boat, so we can go real, real shallow. And what are they doing there? Uh they're just looking for cover for the most part. Okay, yeah. so they're not trying to spawn or anything, shatter a spring spawn. spawn? Yeah, these ones are itty bitty, so they're only a year old, at, like getting to be a year old. Um, okay. So yeah, these these were larval fish in the spring, um, and yeah, they're just the perfect size right now. Everything right, wants two eat. inches. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Yep. And everything can eat it. Everything can eat it. They don't got spines for everything to worry about, sticking them in the mouth. So, so when you are going to, so you're going to go and net shad and we do? Don't, well, we do an acoustic survey, so okay. we net some shad, um, but we use like sonar and stuff like that to see where they are in the columns. So we okay. do that at different spots throughout the lake, different depths, and we'll do a high set, a low set, a, well, a mid column and then a deep set. And that'll tell us like where they're dispersing throughout the night and uh yeah it's pretty cool can you tell year class of those shed at different depths do they tend to is that a uh they're all pretty close to the same size right now okay um okay. so unless it's like an adult adult it's it's pretty hard to tell um because i mean they're like an adult shad can be you, right, right, right. So, Nothing's eating that. At least yeah. not in this lake. No. But, I, I mean, we do see some that are pushing like three inches. Okay. But there's, there's mostly like one and a half to two and a half. So in the, the so in the daytime right now, it's it's nine, nine o'clock in the morning. If you, if, if your group was going to go do that survey, would you be out over deep water looking for that, that shad to be suspended? Or would they be, or are they a bottom orientated bait fish that you might find where you know on the outside weed edge in 15 foot of water pegged to bottom yeah because they are filter feeders they do tend to stick to the middle and top of the column go yeah, okay yeah okay um obviously when you're up here on the west end and it's only about 14 to 20 feet for the most part you're, you're going to be fishing pretty deep for them like they'll be hanging out around in those teens okay but yeah, once you start getting But down, not necessarily bottom orientated. Not necessarily. Yeah, they're they're looking for the for the plankton and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, this is actually perfect because the last time it's funny, in the future I'm gonna get those little lapel mics because a couple of guys have said, you know, when we're too far apart it's hard to hear. Yeah. This is perfect and you're welcome to stay as tight to me as you want awesome. to. Yeah. Um so that's yeah, that's fascinating because that's what's gonna that's what's gonna make the fishing world go round. Now, those shad will stay as a main forage until ice. For the most part, yeah. Okay. Yeah, for the most part, 
Uh, usually winter time is when the they'll switch back over to bugs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, obviously, we don't take many samples during ice season. Sure. But sure. Um, yeah, they they eat a lot of mayflies in the winter. It's surprising. Okay. Like if if you get a good cute pile on the ice, you'll see some mayfly carcasses in there. Huh. But um. Yeah, and I know plenty of guys that fish with like mayfly pattern jigs. Sure. And they'll they'll catch. Sure. Birds something that looks them. buggy or helgramite or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like a, yep. a regular trout fly and a mayfly pattern. Yeah. You drop that down the bottom. Yep. You'll catch some fish. Yep. But I uh, yeah, for the most part from now until we get some ice, they're gonna be eating those shad. So that's fascinating. So we really should be on a shad bite from now on. For the most part, yeah. I mean, obviously they're still going to be eating yellow perch and gobies. But yeah, yeah. Shad are going to be the main forage until we uh, start seeing the ice. And so shad, okay. So then those shad, and I and I keep saying about where the shad will be, trying to give guys, okay, if you're going to come to the lake and and you're like, wow, I'm not sure where to fish this fall. Well, let's go find bait because every time I see bait, there's fish underneath it or in it. Exactly. Um, and so no matter what it is, obviously, but then everything I've been seeing, like I said, is in that 10 to 15 foot of water. So are these shad going to live over the soft bottom predominantly as opposed to rock? Yeah. Because there's more... Yeah, uh, I do feel like we see way more of them in the weedier parts of the lake. Oh, really? Um, just because of the cover aspect. Um, oh, so will those schools go into the weed lines? Yeah, so like when we do the shocking over in, say, Billington, we're going through those weeds and you'll just have a shoal of shad jumping out in front of you the entire time. Wow. Just because they're so thick in there, hiding in the weeds, in okay. the shallows. Um, and that, again, is part of that inshore migration at night. Yeah. Just looking for cover, a way to escape, but it doesn't work out too good for them because <laughs> right. we see a lot of fat walleye coming Right, over. right, but, uh, right. Yeah, it, it's going to be, I think it's going to be a fun shore bite season and uh, definitely tell guys to get out at night this year. Always yeah. worth a try. Yeah. Always worth a try. Yeah. Well, and, and typically, typically, you know, giving guys that heads up of you know night usually means shallow yeah oh, and yeah. and shallower than you might think yeah um and and being able to fish something you know either weedless or weightless through those weeds can really be deadly and you don't have to be on the bottom you know exactly. you could be in 10 foot of weeds exactly. and they're right to the surface and you know and, you can get it through there they'll eat it yeah and that's that's why we see so many guys fishing with flies on the south shore yeah. So they can stay right on top of the weeds for the most part. Yeah. They don't get hung up too often and you just wait out however deep you're comfortable. Right. 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 And you're gonna cast the fly line, you know, damn near as far as you're gonna spinning rod. Exactly. You know, especially in the right evening. So Exactly. Where, where is Cornell's focus for for the fall? Like what is what that's, are what are the important things? That's when we're looking to do our recapture for the walleye. So the ones that we clipped in the spring. Okay. This is when we start going out and electro shocking real heavy. So we look for predators for the most part. So bass, walleye, pike, that kind of stuff. And we'll puke them. We'll make them puke, see what they're eating, and look for those clipped walleye so we can get our proportion of clipped to non-clipped fish. And Get a nice little estimate for everybody. So, those clips, are they rotating those clips depending on year class? Yep, yep. So, like this year, we had fish that we had clipped in the last study. So, it was the opposite ventricle fin. Yep. Um, and then it's half clips, full clips. So, it, it does rotate. Is there any tagging operation on walleyes out here? Not here. Okay. Um, on the Great Lakes, USGS does a little bit. Okay. Look at like where they're spawning, like where they're hanging out in the hot weather. Yep. That kind of stuff. Um, 
honestly right now their biggest focus is our on whitefish and lake trout up there. But um yeah the walleye that's whitefish where, really? Yeah whitefish. Has have have the whitefish made a comeback? They've made a little bit of a comeback, like with the Cisco, that variety, but um Really? Yeah. Well the Western Great Lakes there's a there's a whole little ecosystem around those whitefish. Exactly. Besides exactly. the fact that they're delicious eating. Exactly. I mean, um, I would love to be able to go out and get five pound whitefish out of that lake and take a limit of them and, and oh, yeah. smoke them. My oh, God. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's an effort. They want to bring them back to a fishable level like Cisco and salmon. Yep. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, that's where we get a lot of the movement data from walleye historically, like to look at how much they actually move. Right. Like okay. Like seeing fish that have come from Erie, ending up in Ontario and stuff like that. Yep. Or even fish from here moving to Ontario. Sure. Our, our tagging is mostly with the sturgeon. Gotcha. That's pretty much the only thing we tag. I saw one jump down here. Uh, yeah. Actually, it was right down here <clears throat> a couple months ago. I have it on video even. Nice. And it's quite a ways away, but you can clearly see that big white belly. I mean, clear as a bell. We saw it that day. The sun was shining on it. And, and I saw it as it was coming back down. My buddy's fishing right here. He goes, oh, my Lord, did you? And I and I look up, and I could just see it splashing. But it's on video, and it, and it was enormous. And it was... It was that far out of the water, like it wasn't joking around. Oh no, yeah, it's insane. What's the biggest one of those you you guys have seen in here? So the one that we have painted on the hatchery wall, that's the biggest one, and it was six foot eight and a hundred and eighty nine pounds. Wow, and that's not a big one. No. Like those those Columbia River fish go ten or yeah, twelve feet. Yeah, as far as sturgeon go, yeah. see, they're all twenty six at the right. oldest. Yep. Yeah. So since then they've made a huge comeback all over. Like oh, okay. Cayuga, Seneca, here, you name it. But um Yeah, because they've been so so that's when the program started. Yep, nineteen ninety five and ninety six. those were the first stockings here. Okay. And then um yeah, they've been doing. Was that when thing. they started the spoonbill, or is that what they're called? Uh, the the or paddle tail. What's the ones they're putting in the Niagara? That they were that they were ow oh, that they were raising here. Oh, paddlefish. Paddlefish. Oh, yeah. fish. yeah, they're the yeah. ones with the big bill. Yeah. Filter feeders. They're huge. They're really cool. Yeah. I'm not familiar. I don't know if they took well or not. I oh. Yeah. I remember the seeing them in the hatchery years ago when they started that program. Yeah. But I know, like, the southern Midwest, that, like, their stronghold. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think they'd be really cool to have around here. But I don't know if Oneida would be the place for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, buddy. I appreciate right. that. Yeah. I, uh, I, people are going to love to hear that the shad are here already, you know, and that, and that, that fall fishing and night fishing can start right away. Yeah. All right, that'll do it for today, everybody. Big shout out to Jake. He stopped. Every time he sees me, he stops. And Jake from Cornell, and and we have a conversation about what's topical on the lake, and from a scientific standpoint, and from the from how it benefits the anglers too. Um, everything he said today about the shad and and their behaviors, and I was trying to get him to talk about their behaviors. Is I'm thinking the whole time to myself is. So I want to make this I want to make this information that he's giving us the angler useful and have a me you know so guys can say okay the shad are around now and shad are filter feeders so that means that they're looking for for vegetation and algae to feed on and where would that be and and then he said they 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 live in the in the shallows especially at night and you know we can be night fishing already so so stuff like that is really very cool and I asked those questions to him specifically to try and bring it back so the science, so we can have a better idea how the science and the angling go like this. You know, he's asking us questions and getting, gathering information 
and then we were asking him what what information is important to them as a as a university but as an arm of the of the state and, and the health and they're in charge of the health and welfare of this lake and its population of fish so I try to give things back and forth that are that are interesting and relatable to those us to, to us anglers so thanks again and as always have a great day thanks for joining me keep your tip up